Excellent. Uh, so, my name is Andrew Macklin. Uh, I'm an actor and uh, a qualified career coach working with creatives. And we're having a series of conversations around what it means to live well as a creative in the world today. And I'm joined by the rather excellent and amazing uh, Ross Bowa Williams and, and his dog. What's the dog's name, Ross? Uh, so, this is Braun. Oh. There he is. Yeah, as you can see, just, just look at He's my colleague. He's been my colleague throughout lockdown. So, uh, yeah, at the moment, he's kind of just doing that thing of like, okay, I'm just going to watch for a bit and then figure out what's going on, then sleep. So, uh, <laughs> I, I feel very much like Bond was giving me the evil eye there. There's quite a, there's a level of intensity. Yeah, he's like, you've not been in this household before. <laughs> so <you> check you out. <laughs> so, Ross, you're a, a creative producer and uh, we've interacted and worked together in at different points over the years in different organizations, um, with, uh, predominantly with Emergency Exit Arts, but you're currently working with Punch Drunk, is that right? Yeah, so uh, I've been there, well I say I've been there for, I, I had my year anniversary in August, but with obviously the world being in the, the shape that it is at the moment, it kind of feels weird when I kind of count on my fingers. It was kind of six months active working and the time I go back post furlough, it's six months uh, furlough. Um, so I feel like I've been cheated out of six months, but hey, you know, there's, there's worse things to uh, have happened in the world. So I do say a year, but at the same time, I'm like in brackets, six months. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think everyone's had, yeah, everyone's had massive changes in that regard. I'm not exactly sure what they are or where they are or what work is to a degree. Um, yeah. I, I'm really interested in the title creative producer and I, I've got a, a fair inkling as to what your job entails to a degree, but I wonder how, how do you describe what it is that you do? That's a really good question because I, I, have, I, I think I'm still trying to figure out what it means and what I've kind of learned over the last oh God, few years is that the word producer, creative producer, whatever kind of producer you want to call it. It means different things to completely different people in different sectors. So I've been quite curious going, oh, that's interesting. That's how it's interpreted in a museum and gallery setting. Uh, or, oh, that's how it's interpreted uh, uh, from a, a council point of view. So it's, for, I think for me, um, the way I would personally interpret it, and it would probably go along the lines of, someone that can help creatively logistically make an idea happen so i do see it as quite it's a very collaborative process mm -hmm. um i i've always seen that role as being a conduit as part of a bigger team a bigger picture rather than kind of someone in in isolation um but yeah i, I think that's probably how I currently interpret that and it would be interesting to see or hear kind of other people's interpretations of it but I would say they, the headlines would be that kind of person that helps the cog moves <laughs> I think is probably the best way of describing it. I mean, that feels like a really open definition in a, in a good way because it's really clear to me what it is that you do in making the helping these ideas to, to occur to, to make them happen um, because quite often I think there's a, a definition of what someone is doing can more often than not be a limiting thing it can actually cut out other potential options and so it's interesting that in your world of producers that a lot of those definitions are things that seem to be quite singular whether it be at museums or whatever, and it feels like you've come to a kind of definition that it's a bit more inclusive of, of a variety of things. Yeah, d definitely. And I think it probably speaks true to kind of where I probably see myself in the sector and kind of where my passions align, which has always been in a place that kind of all of these different art forms or ideas can bleed into kind of like this glorious, kind of mixing pot, I suppose, uh, rather than looking at it from a secular point of view of this, I see myself as a theatre producer or a participation producer. Um, obviously there's people out there that have those definitions or they would articulate themselves in that way, which is you know totally cool and acceptable, but 
I've always, yeah, there's something about kind of blurring those lines a bit that I think is probably for me a bit more exciting and can lead to more unpredictable places, which is kind of like a big, uh, big driver for me. It feels like unpredictability, as you said, is that big driver. And so I get a sense for you that actually uh, things are constantly changing and that you're kind of okay with that. But I, I wonder, given that it's not such a, such a strict definition that you work under, where did you begin with this? So at what point were you like, this feels like something professionally I'd like to do? Where did the beginning of this journey start, really? Um, oh, good question. Um, wow, where did it begin? Um, I think it kind of began maybe in kind of two or three places. Um, I think that the first place was when I was um, studying. So I went to the um, Royal Central School of Speech and Drama, uh, very clanky title, uh, and the course I undertook was called Drama Applied Theatre and Education. So the beauty of that course uh, for me, even though it was looking at from more of a the discipline of a performance background, it was looking at how you engage um, kind of performance, uh, creative engagement in different settings with different people so you kind from a young age so I think I would have been 19 um, you suddenly had this this word arts completely blown up and it didn't necessarily mean art in this building or art under that proscenium arch it was very much uh, here's a different social context here's a care home uh, here is a pupil referral unit uh, here is a tree house, wherever it might have been. It's, and it was really refreshing going, oh, actually, okay, you've got multiple possibilities and it's about taking and creating opportunity in these different settings with these different people with, you know, varying needs. So that was like, the first thing of going like multiple places to explore. The second thing during my time at Central is um, it was one of those light bulb moments was in 2006 uh, Artichoke, wonderful, wonderful company and Roll Deluxe brought the Sultan's Elephant uh, to London. So I don't know if you remember this or it's just one of the most inspiring, mind blowing things I've ever seen. And it was essentially a gigantic robotic elephant that was puppeteered by hundreds of people and it also followed it was uh, it, the other puppet was called a little girl but she was absolutely ginormous so over the weekend you kind of followed these these kind of giant spectacular creatures and what they were doing in the places they'd end up and there was that other moment of just by chance seeing this thing going wow that's something completely amazing. It's in a space that I never thought I would see a giant elephant walking through Trafalgar Square. Um, there was something about people just stopping in the tracks. These might be people that may never have had the privilege of seeing something like that in their own spaces. And there was just this amazing point of talking of like, oh my God, like, let's take a picture. Have you ever seen a giant elephant and a giant little girl? And there was that moment of kind of just going there's something in that for me and I think at the time I didn't know that that would be a further trigger of really wanting to emulate what that was uh, but obviously not necessarily replicating it in its carbon copy form but something about spectacle people uh, opportunity and trying to find that in some kind of role or capacity for me was kind of the beginnings of what that producer journey was of trying to find the complete it's a puzzle and there's a joy in kind of going to make that happen you need the partnership you need the agreements you need the place then there was the next bit of the what and the that creative journey and the ideation of it so i think that started to kind of spark some something there and I think the third thing then was just happy accidents leaving and I threw myself into freelancing for for a while and I met the wonderful London Bubble and at London Bubble I met the wonderful Alex Evans who told me about this other wonderful organization called Emergency Exit Arts and before I knew it like all of these like dots and lines were all kind of lining up and pointing me to that wonderful place called Emergency Exit Arts where 
I would then later find that all of these things were there, but in different shapes and, and sizes. And instead of sticking an elephant in Trafalgar Square, it was, let's put this elephant in a, a school playground and see what that is. How can you recreate spectacle without literal pyrotechnics and fireworks, but play with wonderful ideas and happenings and that kind of all then went click, 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 click. And I was like, I think, and they call it a producer role. So that's what I will be then. <laughs> I don't think there was ever a moment of going, I need to be that thing. It just happened to be that thing. Wow. I mean, it's, that's quite an experience. I mean, what comes across is that sense for you that at Central, that art was everywhere, which sounds like a great education mm. to art, that it's not yeah. 100% March. And there's that lovely image of, I have this image of you walking around London and coming around a corner to see this giant man, this giant elephant, and suddenly going, oh, there's something about this. And the way you broke it down to its sort of constituent parts, something about a big spectacle, within a community, in a place you wouldn't normally expect it. And then you were sort of talking about, you know, the idea that what happened next after that was sort of quite a natural, not sure what's happening exploration until you found yourself in that title. Yeah. And, and you mentioned around that sort of idea of producers being, um, fixing a puzzle. So it's a puzzle of what we need to create to try and create this bigger picture. And so I wonder for you then, when you were leaving Central, and it sounded like there was quite a few influences already, you, it seemed like you were already not going to go on that particular path that I'm sure a lot of people leaving might have done. Mm -hmm. And so what, what were the sort of challenges when you first left? Because I, I imagine there were avenues you could have went down that mm -hmm. colleagues and peers were, well, I'm going to go and clearly do this job because that's sort of what we're structured to do. So what were those challenges, if any, when you were starting out? Um, oh, I, I remember there were a few challenges before I got to the end. I think the first thing was I was start. I, I, I loved being in that learning sphere and that learning bubble and the prospect of that ending suddenly was quite, quite threatening. And I was like, Oh my God, what am I doing? And I remember I very hastily, um, got onto an, an MA, um, and I went through this whole process and it wasn't until I was really at the end going, I think what this actually is, it's fear about just getting out into the world. And I think what I need to do is let go of this other opportunity because I, I don't, I think this is just a, a distraction at the moment rather than a real impulse or need to, to do that thing. So that was let go. I think at the time I, I was working in freelancing at London Bubble, it was this amazing, well, it is still amazing. It was a massive organization when I was there at the time. And through working there, I was starting to get like a real flavor for the, what they were doing with the community. Sorry, that's Gron and his giant falcon bell. Um, I, I loved their, their work. I, they were taking amazing things to parks. And I was like, this is where I, I think I'm supposed to be. So maybe if I hang around long enough and do the right thing, maybe eventually there'll be a job. But then unfortunately, uh, there was throughout uh, 2007 and eight, there were tremendous art uh, cuts in the arts. Arts Council were kind of uh, halving. They weren't called national portfolios then, they were called regularly funded organizations. And unfortunately, London Bubble was one of the organizations to lose its funding. So from kind of being there and seeing all of this huge program, all of a sudden it got reduced and shrunk and they had the letter saying, I'm sorry, but we're not funding you anymore. They had three months to reduce their team. I think it was like 18 to a team of three. So it suddenly felt like, oh God, this is the worst time to be in this sector right now. And there were other organizations that I was also either working with or kind of just fans of seeing them either shrink or disappear completely. So there wasn't a part of me that was necessarily going, I've made a really stupid choice in my life here. It was more, I knew this is going to be a bumpy ride. And once again, through a process of uh, happy accidents, uh, I kind of then went, well, I'm just going to try and do something. So, 
uh, tried freelancing as kind of a creative practitioner for a while. I still managed to kind of keep a gig going with uh, London Bubble. Um, and then it kind of opened up other opportunities um, to work with other organizations, experience their creative learning programs, their community engagement programs. And so I started to kind of meet all these other people. And once again, you kind of go, oh, that's an interesting job you've got, or that's an interesting process or idea. Um, and I kind of needed to go through that kind of quite challenging time of, I know I've got this job this week. I don't know what next week looks like, but it will be fine. And, you know, we all lived quite a, a bohemian life at the time. Uh, there were eight of us that shared a house and it was very, you know, cut your cloth accordingly. But we were like, we've got to stay in the arts. So, but I'm really thankful for those times because once again, it all, you know, it sounds like a bit of an, an, an I'm an alternative, um, an optimist uh, but it all happens for a reason and those things kind of led me down the path that I then started to follow and when other opportunities and funding started to stabilize it was made me go well actually the Arts Council isn't the only um, lifeblood in making work happen I'm, I'm met and worked with some wonderful uh, non-core funded charities and you go they're doing work they've got more autonomy and I kind of went down that path for a while. So, but I needed that, that earthquake over there to happen to make that direction and that doorway pop up. So yeah, I think it was, it was, so this is probably a long winded way of saying it was a bit of an accident, but I, yeah, went all around the houses down all the paths, but I it eventually led me down the one that I thought this is, yeah, going to lead me to, hopefully some really intriguing places and I that's when I kind of started to kind of phase out the freelancing part of me and start it was part-time and then I got taken on full-time and it kind of was built up from there really. I think it's really interesting and useful to hear because from the outside quite often people look at someone's career and kind of assume that it's been a clear trajectory because uh, it must be a clear trajectory to get from where they started to where they are and that that has been always a very competent and clear direction and so to hear you talk about well actually to a degree the masters was sort of keeping safe and there was a fear element there and then you know leaving and there being a couple of dead ends potentially and then of course an economic crash <laughs> and so you, you get this uh, and what it reminds me of a little bit is uh, it feels a little bit like that experience that you had at that point when you joined London Bubble and you were, it felt like gaining so much from these ideas and these other people that you were working around and then suddenly this chop happened and it reminded me a little bit about the experience that's kind of currently happening now I'd imagine for a lot of people maybe just starting off and so I wonder on, on reflection and of course everyone's situation is different but on reflection looking back on it what's your sense of what is needed or required of other producers whether they be creative or not starting out or in their first year or two in the industry now who've just come out and are in the same position you were back then suddenly going i've just left i've just left my qualification i'm a year or two in the industry and boom COVID happens yeah yeah i mean it's the impossible question but yeah what what do you think might be useful for them to hear or know um wow what would i what would i say um i think one of the things would definitely be um have an have an open mind and an open heart and i the, i say those things because sometimes when i speak to some people that are um part of a trainee program or they might just be doing the ma in creative producing or, or you know similar things is that they're looking for a theater company and a theater role and they sometimes have quite um, um, a specific framework that they're looking to work in. And I think for me, it very much is kind of going, maybe you've got that framework because maybe you're unaware that out there in the big wide world, there's actually this whole other universe where your frameworks can completely be expanded because there's different experiences and opportunities that use your skills 
that use your passions and your knowledge and will probably challenge your creative process and how you produce as well. Um, so I, I kind of say, you know, the first thing when I say, where are you looking for jobs? They're like, oh, I'm on arts jobs and I'm, I'm you know, looking at recommendations from friends. It's like, well, do you know about the museum sector and galleries? And they're like, oh, I know, but I do theatre producing. And it's like, well, you never know unless you try. And I've always been a big fan of, you know, try it at least once, you know, put on a new skin and, um, you know, big fan of, you know, fake it till you make it. And I, you know, understand and remember that, that being in the echo chamber of, I'm sorry, on this occasion, we went with someone with more experience than you. Um, but the thing is, you know what, until you kind of throw yourself in there and just give it a go, you'll never have that reference point of saying, well, actually, there was something in that, that I took myself out of my comfort zone. And I really just in enjoyed that, that moment of surprise or just that project. But I'd say really kind of just open your mind to what opportunities are out there. And there's so many wonderful community organisations that are looking for people that have those skills but once again it might not be advertised as creative producer but you're using your skills and however you then want to kind of articulate that opportunity to your next employer or to get your next gig you know people aren't precious about titles people aren't gonna go I know but here it says a uh, program manager not producer um, you will find a way of kind of utilizing your skills and then I think it's by chance that you kind of find you know the job with the, the right title and all the, the stars align you will have that moment but to get there I'd say just yeah take a risk and chuck yourself out there and I think the other thing is um, be more than your job. Um, I always remember one of, <laughs> I had this surge of like confidence when you leave and you're like, you look at all of these jobs that are out there and you're like reading it and you're like, yeah, I can do that. Uh, because you have to trick yourself into going, I've put myself through three years of debt. I have to have something to show for this. I remember like applying to like the Philharmonic Orchestra not to be part of the orchestra, but I think one of the job was like um, education director, which you go at 21 is absolutely ludicrous. But at the time I'm like, yeah. And one of the criteria was ha have to uh, play an instrument up to level five. That was like the essential. And I was like, I can't do that, but I'm just going to try and kind of put a nice little spin on it. Like I really advocate kind of using uh, uh, music and tapping into people's musical intelligences through a variety of techniques during a workshop. And you're like, what are you doing? Um, but kind of, sorry, slight aside, in terms of just faking it till you make it, there was also that point where going through these interviews where people are like, tell us about you. And I'd be like, I'm Ross, I just graduated and I do this. And they're like, no, 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 we know that because you've written it on your CV. Tell us about you. What makes you tick? What are this, what's the stuff outside of your education? And I literally felt like the most boring, undynamic person. I was like, I like, I, I think I actually said the words, I like swimming, which is cool. You know, great recreational pastime. I think I also said like, I like the, going to the cinema. Do you know when you're just there and just like blank? And I was saying all these things and I remember leaving going, oh, I knew two things. One, I was not getting that job. And second, I was like, I'm, I'm really boring. I don't feel like there's, I, I've nurtured that other part of me. And I think sometimes we separate ourselves into, this is my work part and this is my other part. And I think at the time what I was, you know, very foolishly doing is trying to uh, articulate myself in just the work part and then um, I needed to kind of see that actually all of these things are kind of serving the same purpose which is me being this holistic person that has passions and interests and and skills so but once again that was a great learning point for me of going right I need to turn on its head and then a couple of months later I'm like I'm just going to do something. Found a wicked course at, um, it was circus space. I think now it's National Centre for Circus Arts, I think. And that started like a three year love of just doing some equilibristics, some globe walking, some juggling. And I did it generally not to go like, 
this will be really kooky to tell them when I have my next like interview. But actually it reminded me, A, I love learning and B, I wanted to do it. And actually that is feeding this thing here. And what I would say to people is kind of don't neglect kind of those parts of yourself, like really kind of nurture it, whether it's gardening, whether you are kind of an avid pyrotechnist or you like making kind of miniature models, like that isn't an othered thing. That thing should completely be brought into your practice and your ideas. Because when you are in a rehearsal room or you're in a studio or you're in an office and you're producing, you're going to kind of bring, draw from all of these experiences in some way, shape or form. But the trick is, or I suppose the hard thing is you won't realize it until you're there and kind of going all those other things that you did all are kind of part of you and your job and your identity. Once again, this I, I realize this probably sounds like quite wishy-washy and a bit like oh zen and but I I'm yeah, nurture all those other bits. No, I mean to to I guess to reflect back what I'm sort of hearing is that it's uh, be more than your job. Uh, yeah, be very exactly. ex in a very expansive sort of way. And I think uh, a lot of people fall into a lot of difficulties, I think, in this pressure to be an impressive thing, yeah. whatever that might be, and at all other costs, neglecting the sort of groundwork or yeah. other elements. And then ultimately either, as you were describing, find themselves boring <laughs> in an interview, yeah. or I think it has, it has other effects and draws away from other but, aspects. Totally, and I think the, it reminds me it's those moments where and actually you know one of the golden threads of uh, um covid is uh, it's given us a lot of time to reflect and the thing that i i've been reflecting on most is one of the things is um i if i do a, a graph of my week or my year i always try and keep those other parts of me sacrosanct so i know whether it's kind of i want to go swimming or i want to go to this gym class or i want to do this wildlife drawing thing i'm i'm there's points where i'm really good in in keeping that time to myself and when i say i'm leaving at six i need to leave at six but then there's certain points in my year to, which are kind of pressure points when it gets to a project going live or something being put out into the world where I let go of those things and then the long weekend, the, the long day uh, days become long weekends. You know what it's like. Everyone in the sector has been through. You kind of end up doing it because you love it and you want it to be the best thing it can be. But then what I've realized is that if I look at those points where I'm like going down and I've let go of all those other things, that's when I become a work zombie. And when you're in a, a situation with friends or a party, whatever, and people go, how are you? And the, if the first thing that comes out of your mouth is, yeah, work's really good at the moment. Yeah, this the really cool thing will be happening. And you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. They said, how am I? And I just went straight into, yeah, work, work, blah, 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 blah. And of course, work is important to all of us because we're more than just our jobs. It's a career, it's a passion, but it's something really wrong. If I, my default is, I'm just going to talk at you and tell you a progress update. I'm like, what is it? I can't be a work zombie because I feel really undynamic and I feel really dull and I'm trying to be more mindful. And I think it's, it's an ongoing journey of the right kind of balance, not letting go. I suppose, yeah, keep, keeping some parameters around your, your work life, but nurturing the other parts of your life so you don't end up becoming this work zombie. Um, I think that's, that's quite important. <laughs> I, I can completely resonate with that. I, I usually have to add on a little additional uh, phrase when I ask, how are you to other actors? I mean, in real life, how, how are you in, in real <laughs> life? Just to separate the professional to the, so I think there is, yeah, I think yeah. You, you hit the nail on the head there with that sense of, and, it, and life can become all consuming in that sort of professional yeah. realm. But I think, yeah, I, and I think it's, um, we're not really encouraged or taught it, I think, about expanding that, which is odd, I think, as artists and creatives, it should be against a sense of, you know, you should be looking out into those areas to fuel yourself because ultimately, I guess, what's more sustainable, the work zombie, 
is eventually uh, in a year or two time going to think, well, what am I actually creating or making? And so the most sustain sustainable way of doing it, I guess, is, is a lot about what you're suggesting. And, and I love what you mentioned there as well around the idea of, it sounded like when you were going through that uh, recession period, 2007 and eight, you were mentioning about just your skills and where they fit in the world, as opposed yeah. to, well, I'm a theater producer and so I have to find theaters that work. Yeah. It feels like you just cleaned the board of titles and went, I have these skills, these are my interests, where can, I, where can they fit in? I, I wonder, um, a theme that sort of has come up in a lot of these talks, and I think is really crucial, especially now, is reaching out to other collaborators and artists and other organizations and that point of contact. Mm -hmm. um, it's becoming, um, with, the, you know, with the use of Zoom, there is opportunity to do that in a way that maybe there hasn't been to a degree before. And a problem a lot of artists I meet, or freelancers, would have this sense of being outside of an industry. So mm. there are people that are an elite in an industry and I'd love to get in contact with them, but look, I'm down here, they're up there, or I'm not really part of the industry. And there can be this sense that grows that you can block collaboration to a degree. And so it sounds like you have had to, in that faking it till you make it way, have had to reach out continually to a lot of people. And I know that in your work as well, you're, you're consistently out and meeting people and, and whatnot. So with that in mind, what would be your, you know, what have you found helpful over time in that mm -hmm. process of reaching out to people? Um, yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so I, I think one of the, the, the joys of my job, uh, whether it be producer at Punchdrunk or all the stuff I do outside is a big part is about relationship building and it's about people and it's working with freelance artists and striking up new partnerships and I think what I find really exciting is sometimes you're going to be in a room and there is always, I think we carry that, um, uh, what's that feeling called, um, imposter syndrome feeling where you're like, oh my god, I'm in a room with like all of these very knowledgeable people about this particular thing which represents the room that we're in, whether it's a, I don't know, a library to a museum. Um, but then what I find really interesting is those people in that room, they obviously, like you, they might have a particular experience, but there's something really wonderful in kind of going, you've got something there and we've got something. So the whole purpose of collaboration has to be about learning, right? And it has to be, how can this idea rub up against this idea to make something happen? And I think there's been, um, sometimes there's that wonderful process of osmosis where it can just work. Sometimes it doesn't work, which is, you know, why sometimes we call it R and D. <laughs> we'll take the stuff that works and we'll kind of learn from the stuff that didn't, but probably go, uh, we'll either not do that again or we'll do that a different way. Um, but I personally have always felt that um, I feel like a bit like the bee in, because I've kind of left that one room, but then I'm going to go into another room and have a conversation. It becomes almost a bit like um, open space where you're like, oh my God, this person just told me this really cool thing. And before I, what I just think is a, just an, an anecdote that I'm, the reason I'm sharing this anecdote is because they said something that sparked something. We're actually then feeding that into some kind of artistic brief or going, oh, and it's, what, it's when the magic words happen of like, I wonder, I wonder how that would work. Or uh, imagine that. I think if you can get to that place where you're using those words, then you're going to start bringing in that conversation that happened from just that initial partnership meeting or see a, an artist kind of shows you their portfolio and, and they're really into kind of making miniature things. And you're like, oh my God, wait there, there's a project for me here. There's an idea. And I think for me, one of the most powerful things is how we can be generous and we can kind of um, take those experiences to make that thing and obviously give credit where credit is due rather than like, I've solely had this wonderful idea <laughs> uh, that tends to happen because of, you know, it's, it's owned somehow by people and we're magpies and we like to kind of move things around and, you know, spin it ourselves. There's that part of it, but there's also kind of just that, I don't know, that, that wonderful satisfaction of 
um, connecting people and sometimes if it doesn't necessarily work out in your world or if it's not for example a punch drunk project there's something wonderful going you two need to chat because I've met both of you or for different reasons but you're looking for this person you're looking for a venue you're looking for some expertise something could happen here but I think there's always that chance of how do you get it past the initial chat into materializing into something an idea a commission but I think having that role of connector really really helps and if I see things like on Twitter or things that come through kind of email I really try and remember the network of people I'm like oh my god I've got to ping that to Andrew oh my god Anna and Andrew really love this or so I think sometimes it's thinking about what's going to connect in my world but how do you share that further afield uh, and I get so much satisfaction from being a connector and I never thought I did before but now I've realized I do because I'm like there's an opportunity this can't be wasted we need the right people to find that thing so I think there's a process of yeah rubbing up against each other or for want of a better word or just especially during COVID where you can't do that metaphorically or physically just yeah allowing yourself to be open and take bits of inspiration from people is just yeah I've been key to collaboration before and I think as you said during the times that we're in will be even more key moving forward and um, I've you know I've always had quite mixed feelings about um, Zoom the Zoom room and uh, having Zoom fatigue but actually what it it's a great leveler in terms of we can all find a time and a space so rather than people wasting not wasting a uh, feeling like they have to give up half their day to have that perspective meeting that could lead somewhere it's kind of just going let's be direct let's have a chat and we don't need to use any minimal resources to do that uh, but you can still collaborate and I've seen forums I've seen kind of these monthly kind of twitter gatherings where people are you know carrying on that spirit even if they can't physically do it IRL out there what comes across a is your your energy about it clearly this is uh, an area that the connector role is something that seems to really enthuse you uh, but what comes across is this curiosity and generosity element that mm -hmm. there is a giving and take and it's not necessarily a transactional sort of engagement it's very much a natural sense of what can i do how can i connect these two people what would be most useful for them and i love that that question asking of I wonder I wonder yeah. if this yeah. that seems to be the core of that kind of creativity and expansion so it, it feels very much like I guess a lot of artists who might struggle with this struggle with this idea of you know am, am I taking am I getting what am I mm -hmm. asking for and so mm -hmm. it has this other feel because that I wonder question is a giving and it's coming from a curiosity and it feels at least hearing you talk about it like a very sort of kind place to be in as opposed to yeah. a, a graspy. Yeah, a hundred percent. And for me, it kind of speaks true to, um, I went years ago on a, a philosophy for children's training course. And the, one of the people leading the course said, why would you, ask a question if you already know the answer to it which obviously is quite a contentious idea because of how classrooms run you know predominantly but there was something in that for me going yeah that's really true there's it needs to come from a place of genuine curiosity uh but then i kind of have been thinking about that later on in work and it's not just about how you interact with people in a classroom or they do like philosophy in pubs but actually that should be about creation in general um you shouldn't do something i think if you're just going to follow the same formula or you're not intrigued by what this thing's going to be because it's just going to be stale and it probably won't be that dynamic um so i think having an idea that is really birthed from a place of connection that obviously there's a reason why you're doing it or your organization is doing it because it's fulfilling a particular remit but there's that wonderful moment of we kind of know certain parts of it but there's loads of it we don't know so we kind of 
have to collaborate to go on this journey to make this thing live or work or otherwise it won't be put out into the world and I've had for me that the best moments as I said are when you say the words that I wonder or imagine if but it's when you kind of hear like these really big blue sky um thoughts being put out loud like the sultan's elephant someone had that idea in a room going wouldn't it be really cool if we just had this giant mechanical elephant wandering you know and someone had the bravery of kind of putting it out there they weren't ridiculed they might there might be some people like what are they okay (laughs) like why would why would we do this but you know why wouldn't you do it uh and there's a wonderful thing of kind of having a fear you were like I have no idea how this is going to work but we will figure it out and that we will figure it out comes from every sense for me with a project with whether it be budgetary we find the right expertise we find the right partner and I think it's just the most exciting thing just um, knowing that it's new and it's fresh and it's keeping us on our toes and we're not resorting always to the same formula or the same process. And I think for me, that's been a key thing throughout all of, all of my work. Uh, and I, I work with people for those things. They aren't things I'm going to ever kind of take, um, uh, I don't know, ownership of because they belong to so many people and they span years of weird enrichment activities that happened on the side there and that all fed that thing that where we are now and if I think of my top five projects all of those things came from a place of complete unknowing and curiosity and I think they're things that I'll always um, yeah look back fondly and go there was so much there but I'm so glad it happened in the way that they did happen. I think you describe it really well from the from the point of view of uh, referring to it as bravery. I think it is bravery to have this unknown in front of you and then a, a sense of who knows if this will work. I'm going to put it out there as an idea and we'll, we'll find the how and, and the what at some point later on. But yeah, I think that is, uh, I think that is bravery and it's something very core about creativity in that as well. And I think about how people look at careers too. Quite often there's a uh, yes. a preconceived idea as to what the next step should be and then a sort of well I'm not doing that next step and so yeah. I'm lost and in reality it's well yeah. we're, we're all kind of lost to a degree and it's a sort of an emergent thing as opposed yeah. to a um, and with that idea of sort of creativity and emergence and not knowing the next step I think it can be really useful sometimes to look at careers and at trajectories from a sort of a narrative standpoint because we naturally sort of see things in that way what became before now and and what's next and quite often what's next is sort of interfeeding with what's happening now and informed by what happened previously and so I wonder for you what 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 draws you forward in your career are there ideas that you kind of burn away continually that sort of make draw your curiosity that then you find yourself following that leads to the next step? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. So I feel like all these questions, I I go, that's a really good question (laughs) because they really are. Um, It's interesting. I I, I was having this conversation the other day and we were just reflecting on the the fact that, isn't it funny when you're in uh, an interview situation, one of the questions will be, where do you see yourself in five years? And we were like, why five? What is there? Is five the magic? Can we be radical and go maybe two? Like, let's see how we get on first and then let's go to five. And that idea of um, sometimes people need putting pressure on themselves to go at that stage in my life, I need furniture, I need a full time job, and possibly a really good school that my future children, maybe in 10 years, will then go to. and I think for me, I, I, what do I think? I think that there's a lot of unknowns in the world. And I think the art sector and us all in it, we're quite resilient people. And we've been through recessions, we've been through cuts, you know, 
we're, we're really good. We're like cockroaches. We will survive somehow or some way. We will always make things happen some, in some place. And so when I think about where the world will take us next, and where it will take me next, I kind of, maybe I'm just being really cautious now, but I'm like, you know what? I'm going to be kind to myself and kind to us all and go, there's only so much contingency planning we can do. I think we've all gone through scenarios A to Z and then some of going, this could happen in this way, or this is how I might then work again, or this is how I might be again. I think now I'm kind of at that stage of, of kind of really going small steps of just seeing where the world's at when we're all coming out of the cracks in the floor, kind of going, is the world ready for us yet? Uh, we will always kind of, find ways of tailoring and, and making stuff happen so if I'm thinking in with my um kind of punch trunk um producer hat on it very much is kind of just looking at okay um let's see where we had things planned um we're learning the art of we learned the art of unproducing when we had a very short time to we spent months building up to a particular project and then we had a matter of weeks to unproduce that thing while we all went on furlough. And now we know that nothing will ever get scrapped and none of the beast will get wasted. But we're now learning the art of reproducing or kind of going, okay, what else can it be? And can it work in a particular setting? And when I say setting, I mean kind of, it might be the outside space, for example, or indoor space, but it's got to work with those people because there's no point in us creating this stuff if the people who personally should always be at the center of that thing, they can't interact with it. Why are we doing it? And we, we have to kind of be very people centric. And um, I think we're all kind of keeping our, our ears to the ground going updates. What could this mean? But, I think we're just having to kind of go with it, everyone else on this journey and just we can make those amendments or changes when we get there. But, you know, I think a lot of people are beating themselves up that they haven't got the crystal ball going. I know, but when can I reprogram my tour or when can I put my uh, application in? Because that got kind of shelved because other things took priority. Um, so I think it's, it's kind of, yeah, being a bit gentle and, and seeing where, what happens next. But I suppose taking joy in the things that you can control in your own uh, environments, you know, whether that is um, that thing that you, as we said before, you do on the side, or it's that thing that you're just kind of nurturing, whether it's a new mindset or to help you get to that place. I think taking control of those things and feeling at least we can own something rather than feel like the world is taking everything off us or you know are smashing our opportunities left right and center that's that's an it's great to hear that because um it sounds like there's a few things happening one is a sort of sense of trust in yourself to be resourceful to deal with stuff and also a confidence around you know yeah what comes up i will meet uh, and a sort of drawing back of the perspective for this five year plan idea uh, in this context and in a lot of contexts creates a sort of unwanted pressure, it feels like, especially if COVID yeah. is going to smash the crystal ball at any point. And so it yeah. feels like, and correct me if I'm wrong, that what you've sort of done in a way is sort of went, well, let's bring back the, the lens to what we can realistically see. Yeah. Trust that I can cope with stuff and then just be kind to myself in that yeah. situation. A hundred percent. And I think we've um, had some uh, conversations recently as um, a punch as a team, we've kind of had a few days of just regrouping and those days were really, it's looking at kindness and it's looking at how, let's look at ourselves first and not put any pressures on, we've got to hit the ground running here and that's got to get out, that's got to happen. Because as, as I said, so much of what we do is people centric that we can't do those things until we know a school, a community, a cultural part is ready for, for this stuff. A lot of people are just finding which way is up, you know, after 
reopening. So they're being kind to themselves and going, let's not run before we can walk. But I think we also need to do that. Um, and I think the other flip side of that is, uh, I'll, I'll say the guilty thing, which is during lockdown, people are like, oh, hasn't it been terrible? Uh, there are moments that I've enjoyed it and I've managed to find, you know, some golden threads of something that I go, oh, once again, unless I've really been pushed to that edge, I never would have been thinking or reflecting in this particular way is that I've known a lot of people that have literally are diversifying their skill base or diversifying themselves and kind of going, not feeling there's a guilt with that. And they're like, you know, just for a bit, I'm just going to try baking. And you're like, great, you do, you do that. You saying you need to work from home and you're going to try baking does not make you a failure or does not negate the fact of your other work. Um, maybe once again, <laughs> you might bring baking into your craft <laughs> later and down the line. But there's been a real bravery in people just giving something else a go and diversifying themselves. And I think we've all gone through this. And I've, you know... I've loved watching your journey over the last kind of like year and a bit of kind of where you've got to now, but I think we've all, we've all, we're all doing that in some way, shape or form um, you know, because of, because of COVID in the world and Black Lives Matter in the world, you know, we're just, we're needing to, to change ourselves. So I think there's some really exciting innovations coming through people and who knows what will happen next. Ross, Thank you so much. Uh, I, I have learned so much that I did not know, which is shocking given that I've known you for quite a few years, but it's been, it's been inspiring to hear how you have managed your way through, but also the, the outlook that you maintain and the, the real rigor behind it. There's no sort of fluffy positivity. It's a really sort of rigorous dealing with the world as it is, and yet being, I think, looking for those golden threads, like you say and being optimistic yeah. and using them. So it feels really grounded and realistic. And uh, yeah, it's been inspiring to hear. Uh, thank you, thank you for your time. No, thank, you. thank you, I felt like when you asked me, I was like, oh my God, but these are like proper professional people and uh... <laughs> A healthy dose of imposter syndrome, yeah. <laughs>